Welcome to the Canadian Blind Hockey Podcast. Hello, blind hockey fans, and welcome to episode three of the Canadian Blind Hockey Podcast. I'm your host, Nico Cartarelli, and for this week's episode, I am very pleased to welcome my co-host from the Toronto Ice Owls blind hockey team, Laura Mark. Laura, thanks for joining me today. Hi, Nico. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're so excited that you're able to pitch in today. You've got such incredible experiences within blind hockey and in sports in general. Of course, you're a multi-sport athlete, so uh, we really appreciate you joining us here, and we're excited to get things going on the show. And I'm excited to be here. So, Laura, it's my understanding that you discovered blind hockey when you attended the first ever Canadian National Blind Hockey Tournament as a spectator way back in 2013. As a partially sighted hockey player who had played with sighted players your entire life, what was it like learning that there was such a thing as blind hockey and what were your initial impressions of the sport? Uh, That was a really... uh kind of difficult time in my life um because around that time is when I started to realize I really couldn't play sight at hockey anymore um so I it, it was hard it was hard to kind of come to terms with the fact that maybe hockey was no more and before I had found out about the the tournament I didn't know that there was blind hockey I had never heard of blind hockey I'd always played sight at hockey mm-hmm. um and so like I do play multiple sports and I getting to the point where I was like okay I need to do some research search on what uh, blind sports I can play, um, starting to kind of move away from sighted sports. And so I went on the computer and was doing some research and was looking at other sports. And I happened to come across Courage Canada's 2013 national tournament. And so I read about it. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't look into it in enough time where I could go and play. Um, It was just maybe like a week before that I had found out about it. So I, you know, called my dad up and said, hey, dad, uh, there's this really cool blind hockey thing happening in Toronto uh, next weekend. Do you want to go? Do you want to drive me down and go and check it out? And he, of course, being the hockey dad, said, yeah, let's do it. Um, So we went down and we watched and I really didn't know what to expect. Um, When you think of, you know, blind hockey, you think of they can't see the, you know, the puck and collisions and whatever else it may be. I really did not know what to expect. Um, I didn't realize the puck was the way it was. Uh, so when I got there, it was really interesting and it, I, it surprised me. And I, so it was surprised me that I was surprised because, I mean, as someone who has visual impairment my whole life, I've always believed I can do whatever I want to do. Um, so seeing how fast the sport was really shouldn't have been a surprise to me, but it was how fast paced it was. And Uh, it was really neat to to see that the puck was larger and made noise and so that was kind of my experience and then I met Matt Morrow and Mark Devonis there and they said well you should play I said I didn't bring my gear I you know I didn't know about this Um, but they made sure I came back the following year and ever since I've been playing. Well that's pretty spectacular stuff and obviously we're thrilled to have you as a part of the blind hockey community. Now, I don't know if you know this, and I wonder how many people within the community actually realize this. Um, And of course, we know blind hockey has always proudly been a co-ed sport, but I think maybe the surprising part is that currently only 10 to 15% of blind hockey players are female. Now, all of that said, Canadian Blind Hockey is very proud to be launching its new women's blind hockey program. And of course, that's the theme of this week's episode as well, women's blind hockey. So what does it mean to you to have a dedicated women's blind hockey programming stream available And what sort of impact do you think this will have on the future of the sport? I think this is really important. Um, I grew up playing sight of hockey as someone who was visually impaired. And I played on girls teams growing up. And it's a bond. It's a family. It's a community. And it's, it's nice to play with people who are like your size, your, your speed, your strength. Um, and playing co-ed, you know, I love it. I, it's the challenge, but I do miss that 
you know, before game, after game bonding that you get with players. So as a female player playing co-ed hockey, and like you said, there's only 10 to 15% of us who play, uh, you don't get that bond. You're, you know, you're in a dressing room by yourself, maybe one or two other, you know, female players. You don't get that team team bond. You go in to the change room for, you know, the, the speech with the coach and the players before the game, but that's kind of it, maybe afterwards as well. So I think that will help. It will give you know, females, that bonding experience that some of the guys get every game. Um, and it gives f other female players, whether they're young or old, new to hockey, just starting to play blind hockey, whatever it may be, a safe and comfortable environment to start. Um, because, you know, if you're learning hockey for the first time, it can be intimidating to begin with. And then when you go and step on the ice with, you know, speaking, I say guys, because it's mostly guys, but players who have been playing their whole lives, and who have played very high hockey until they lost their vision, that's intimidating, you know, when they can do circles around you and, you know, you're falling over the blue line or whatever it is. It can be, it can be very intimidating. So I sure. think it's very important that we give girls and females a voice and a place where they can learn the sport that we all love in Canada and that, that we all want to play, but in a place where they can feel comfortable and to, to reach their potential and to, and to play. You know, that's a really um, insightful point and, and a, a great comment. And, you know, obviously we want to encourage um, players, young or old, to come try and, and especially female players, just come out and try the sport. Um, and, and as you alluded to, now there's going to be a, uh, I guess, more of a comfortable scenario for them to come out. But, um, you know, I think what's interesting to me is while at the adult level, percent, um, female per, uh, participation percentage is around 15%. At the youth level, the children and youth level, it's actually around 40%. So um, we're really starting to see that next generation of young female blind hockey players come through the program. So I guess what, you know, for you, what does it mean to be a role model and to help those, you know, that next generation of, of women's blind hockey players into the sport and help them achieve their goals. What does that mean to you? Oh, it means so much. I mean, I had my, you know, female role models growing up, um, you know, and when I played female hockey growing up, females weren't really allowed to play or weren't seen. It wasn't a thing, you know, like even growing up with my peers, like the guys in school would like laugh and say, Oh, you can't play hockey. Um, actually where I grew up, my parents and my teammates, parents had to create an organization so the girls could play because the boys didn't want us on our team. Um, and so like my role models, you know, Haley Wickenheiser, Cassie Campbell, Laura Schuler, um, they just show that it was possible that girls could play, that girls could be talented in playing hockey and it didn't have to be just the, the you know, male sport. So I, they gave me that courage and confidence to do it and that maybe outlet to do it. And so if I can do the same for, you know, especially for blind hockey for, for young children and in youth to do it. I mean, that just, you know, that's what I'm here to do. Like, I love hockey and I want them to be able to enjoy it too and know that they can do it, not just because, you know, they're a girl, they can do it. And also like if they have a disability and they're a female, that they can do it, so. You know, what's your dream for the future of women's blind hockey? Uh, the world, no. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see... Uh, in general, just more participation. And, and I mean, I've always been welcomed with open arms in the Canadian Blind Hockey Association as a female, but just to make sure that all the female players can feel that way. And, and they know that there's a safe place to play. Mm. If we could grow it to Canada and then we could grow the female game outside of Canada to have a female national team would be my, like my top goal is to get there. I mean, that's probably a ways away, but that would be my number one goal is to have it, to say that we can have a female national team. Well, and I think that, you know, as you mentioned, it may not necessarily happen overnight, um, but the important factor is that the wheels are in motion and that is starting to happen. And, uh, you know, I think on, you know, speaking on behalf of Canadian blind hockey, the, the goal is certainly to grow a national program for women all across the world. So uh, I think your goals very much reflect the hopes for this program, for sure. Um, you know, I'm curious because you've had the opportunity to compete at many Canadian blind hockey events. 
What's your favorite part about attending blind hockey programming? The, the community, I guess, would be like one, maybe the top one. And just being able to play hockey. And I think maybe playing hockey with people who understand. Um, so growing up playing sight at hockey, I was accepted. I was able to play, but I always had to almost work that extra little bit harder to prove that I could play with the side of players. Um, and no, and I had to play differently. So like players didn't necessarily understand the way I had to play the game to be as successful as I was. Um, playing blind hockey is community. They get it. They get the everyday life struggles of someone with a visual impairment. And then they get the, you know, how it is to play blind hockey. They understand that you can't just use your, your vision that you have to use your other senses and just your skills and communicate. And I think that is huge. And I think that's the one thing that has kept me wanting to play and you know be a part of this community is is the just the bond and friendship and understanding that everyone has and the support um you know whether you're playing and you get frustrated with somebody because you're just you know their rival on the ice after the ice you can be best friends with them again it, it's just you know it's that competitive on the ice but at the end of the day we're all friends and we're all here to to support and make sure everyone's having a good time mm -hmm. Very well said. Well, Laura, we can't thank you enough for joining us as a co-host for this week's uh, episode as we take a deeper dive into Canadian women's blind hockey. So let's tee up the show for our viewers because ahead we've got interviews from your Toronto Ice Owls teammate, Amanda Proven, and then we'll go out west where we catch up with Calgary Seeing Ice Dogs player Megan Mahan. And then we'll actually head back to the East Coast where we catch up with the captain of the Nova Scotia Sea Kings, Mary Ellen McKechn. And then finally, to wrap up today's episode, we're going to chat with Canadian Blind Hockey Executive Director Matt Morrow to discuss the Women's Blind Hockey Program as well as Canadian Blind Hockey Program programming during COVID-19. So stay tuned because up next we'll be chatting with Amanda Provan from the Toronto Ice Owls. Hey everybody, we're now joined by Amanda Provan from the Toronto Ice Owls blind hockey team. Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Nico. Absolutely. How are you doing through all of this? Uh, it's been pretty tough, but I'm just trying to stay in shape and trying to stay busy. I haven't been out much. Yeah, I hear you. It's tough, and I know we're all itching to get back on the ice, and hopefully that's sooner than later. Yeah, I agree. 100%. Can't wait. Well, speaking of on the ice... You've had quite the career so far, and we're really excited to have you joining the show today. Um, you've got maybe one of the most unique stories as well in the whole uh, community of blind hockey because you travel from, or back in 2017, I should say, you traveled from Sudbury to Toronto for the Canadian National Blind Hockey Tournament, and you participated in the Try It session. Now, at that Try It event, the organizers realized right away that you were a great fit. And right there from that triad event, you were drafted onto a team and competed in the national tournament for the rest of the event. So what was that like for you to simply go from initially trying it to quickly being put on a team and playing in your first tournament? Well, honestly, that was probably the best weekend of my life because it introduced me to the sport and changed my perspective on everything. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, my mom had seen a post about blind hockey on Facebook and, uh, she said there was a try it event and it was in Toronto and I was like, well, can we go? And she's like, well, it's in Toronto, but we had family there. So we went and stayed with them and, uh, I got on the ice and I stick handled the puck a little bit, tested it out. And, um, a few people had asked me why I'd never played blind hockey before. And I, I didn't even know it existed. So, um, actually Wade Shepard had talked to Matt for me to see if I could get playing and um lo and behold I uh ended up on the ice uh, that afternoon and just it was incredible it was so much fun and I met so many awesome people that's pretty incredible um did you have any hockey experience before that initial triad event and tournament 
Yeah, I uh, I play sighted hockey still, actually. Um, mm-hmm. I play in a women's league now, but I played girls and I played high school and stuff. Um, it's always been tough to follow the puck and the, the play, but I've kind of adapted being as that was the only option for me to play hockey. So I just, I just wanted to be a part of it. I just love the sport. Totally. What was that transition like for you then, um, you know, back in 2017 when you were going from sighted hockey and trying blind hockey for the first time? Uh, well, obviously the puck is way different. Um, I can receive a pass. I can kind of track the puck based on hearing and stuff. It's, it made the game a, a lot easier for me. Very so cool. it was, yeah, it was great. You know, in Canada, we've got such a rich history of hockey across all levels. And of course, sledge hockey, a big part of, um, you know, the history of the sport in the nation. That particular pair sport has been in the Paralympics since 1994. And technically, it's always been co-ed. Um, yet no female player has ever actually made Team Canada. Recently, Christina Pickton uh, participated in one of the national team training camps. Uh, there have been a few females that have tried out for the team, but no one's actually made the team yet. And since then, obviously, the women have formed their own national team program. Um, but I'm just curious, for you, being a female on – um, you know, the elite echelon of the scale. What's it like for you to know that there's, um, I guess, a performance, a stream, a clear path now um, where you can work towards a goal of wearing a national team jersey one day? I think it's, uh, co-ed sports are tough in general just because of the, like, biological differences between men and women, strength and size. Um, but just to, to be able to be a contender is great just to keep working hard and um, I'm just I'm just glad for the opportunities that are presented and with the women's development program starting I'm just even more excited for the opportunity to to have more women in the sport and to be able to develop that aspect of it and eventually one day have a women's national team yeah and that's what I was gonna you know ask you next because I know that your goal is just to make the national team whether it be the women's team or you know right now are it I mean it's again technically a co-ed team we've yet to have a woman crack the roster but the current national team is technically co-ed uh, we yeah. saw with the USA they had a few females in Pittsburgh um, so you know I know that you've always aspired to get to that level but as you just alluded to knowing that Canadian blind hockey is now forming a women's specific program. What does that mean to you? And what are you doing? Like, how are you training to achieve those goals? Well, the, the women's program just shows that the growth of uh, the sport in general and um, the growth of women's sports in general, there's been a huge movement for women in hockey this year. And um, I was glad to, I'm glad to see that uh, Canadian blind hockey is following suit. Um, it's just, it's, it's a great opportunity for everyone involved. You know, I think you've got, again, a very unique perspective and experience because you've had the opportunity to meet some of the best female hockey players in the world from, you know, the PWHPA camps, uh, from obviously going to CWHL games when that league was running. What is, you know, what were those experiences like for you to meet um, you know, Olympians and professional women's players and, and kind of shoot the breeze with them and, you know, tell them a bit about your story. What was all that like for you? I think it's great just to be able to kind of have, have people to look up to and role models in the sport and just to, to be able to talk to them and to see what they've experienced and, and, um, and give them my experiences in the sport has just been incredible. It's, it's great to, be able to talk to professional women's hockey players about uh, hockey and uh, about women's hockey specifically. And yeah. You know, you mentioned something there in your answer that I, I want to ask you about, and it was that phrase role model. And I think you're in this really cool position within the blind hockey community, because, you know, with your volunteering as a uh, coach at the GTA children and youth program, I think a lot of young girls look up to you as a player. 
Uh, and, and I think you're inspiring maybe that next generation of female players in blind hockey. So what's that mean to you to be a role model to the next generation of blind hockey players? It's a little scary, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's great. I, I love to be able to help out other people. So if, if being a role model is how that's going to happen, that's it's fine by me. And I'll just try to do my best to be a good role model. <laughs> Oh, for sure. And I think you're doing a great job so far. So just keep doing what you're doing and uh, you'll keep inspiring that next generation for sure. Thanks. Now, you know, people may not know this about blind hockey, but the sport has actually existed for close to 50 years. Um, but yet it, you know, was only when Canadian blind hockey really launched the uniform, unified pair sport of Blind hockey in 2013, that's kind of when it all kind of came together at the first national tournament. It was then another five years before the first ever Canadian national blind hockey team was formed in 2018. You mentioned this earlier in our conversation. The growth of the game is, is just so rapid and it continues to get stronger. And it's not just within Canada, but it's, it's globally around the world and including the women's side of the game where, you know, as we mentioned, there's strong female players and programs across the United States and even emerging in, in new countries like Finland. So I'm curious, from your perspective, how long do you think it'll take to grow women's blind hockey? And what can you as a player do to make sure that the growth does continue to happen? I, I would like to think it would grow quickly, but um, it's it's finding the the players, the female players to play. Um, being visually impaired and a female and into sports mm. really kind of lowers the numbers. So I, I think uh, word of mouth and spreading advertising and uh, stuff like that is very important to get people, to make sure people are aware of the sport, to find the participants to grow the sport. And I think you as a player are doing a great job to help promote and spread the, you know, the growth of the sport in, in what you do through social media, right? I mean, you're often posting pictures or video clips or, you know, sharing your experiences. And that is huge for everyone, you know, in the community and for people who may not know about the sport. So uh, we definitely applaud you for all that, for sure. Uh, yeah, I think it's important just to to spread the word in general because it's uh, blind hockey just changes lives, and if you can get one more person to play, make a difference in one more person's life, it's it's just fantastic, right? You know, like you yeah. gotta gotta make sure everybody knows it's available so they can participate. Yeah, that's an absolutely great point because I think that's you know we do such. Um, tireless work to try spread the growth of the game but obviously that's still uh, something that can continually be worked on is you know just making people aware because you know I think you can speak to that right when you found out about it you wanted to get involved and you made it happen yeah for sure I think about just uh seeing new faces at tournaments and camps every year and it's just like it's the word spreading more and more people are coming out of the woodwork we got some pretty great players that just showed up at camp and it's like where did these people come from <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's pretty cool uh amanda what's your favorite thing about blind hockey i'm gonna say the inclusivity um i just i just love how everybody can play no matter your your degree of vision or your gender or so be it you can get on the ice and just play hockey yeah, even level of skill, right? Even if you're yep. a beginner, there's an opportunity for you to get involved with Canadian blind hockey. Yeah, it's, uh, there's opportunities for everybody and just different divisions at different tournaments and just giving everybody the opportunity to play. Before we wrap things up, I want to do some rapid fire fun stuff with you here. Um, so I'm just going to ask you a few questions. You don't overthink it. Shout out whatever comes to mind and uh, we'll have some fun. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, who is your all time favorite player? Ooh. I like Mitch Marner right now, but, um, hmm. I think in the past, obviously you got the, the greats like Gretzky and Lemieux and stuff like that. I thought for sure you were going to say Natalie Spooner, but okay. All right. <laughs> I didn't even, I, <laughs> that's how bad it is. Women's hockey is so underappreciated. 
that I don't even think of female players when you ask me my favorite. Well, and that's I, something we'll have to, you know, hopefully the, the change happens, right? It's, it's not about NHL players. It's just about who's your favorite hockey player. and That's it. Right? I, I think uh, if we're talking women, actually yeah. probably players in general, I, Haley Wickenheiser is just incredible what she's done throughout her career, what she's been through trying to make teams. And uh, I think she's a doctor now. So on top yeah. of all that, that's pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah, she's done some phenomenal stuff on the front lines in terms of the fight against COVID and, you know, yeah. helping to raise awareness and get PPE to the front lines. So for sure, that's a, that's a great role model for sure. Uh, okay, what jersey number do you wear? I started out with 11. Mm -hmm. um, right now I'm wearing 64, and that, that kind of just came about just because uh, – I wanted 11 and someone had it. I wanted 13 and someone had it. So I just said a random number and then I've kind of stuck with it since then. Okay. I like that. That's how I got my high school football number. It was the two I wanted were taken. So I went with something random and I stuck with it all, all the years I played. So yeah. I like that. <laughs> what is your favorite pregame meal? Ooh, probably pasta. Okay. Yeah, pasta with a meat sauce. Mm. Yeah. You're making me hungry. It is lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your favorite cheat food? I love candy. Oh, yes. What kind of candy? Uh, like nerds, gobstoppers, okay. licorice, just kind of anything. I have a real bad sweet tooth. But you're like more hard candy over gummies because I'm like a gummies type of guy. I like uh, like a sour gummy would be good, but I'm not okay. a big fan of just plain gummies. I don't okay. Know. I, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> uh what is your favorite activity away from the hockey rink Oof. i like to work out does that count yeah of course that counts <laughs> i also like rack. some video games and okay what's your favorite video game i'm i mostly like sports so probably nhl interesting we're gonna have to do a blind hockey nhl tournament because you're like the fourth or fifth person um, that i've talked to over the past month in the community that plays chell so we're definitely gonna have to get like a blind hockey gaming tournament going sounds good <laughs> um now this might be a little biased but who is the easiest goalie in blind hockey to score on I want to say Aaron, but it's not actually true. I just, just want to take a shot at him in a podcast. Yeah, I was kind uh, of setting you up for that, yeah. <laughs> I'm actually not sure. I I can tell you I have a really hard time scoring on Mario Ross. Okay. I don't know what it is. He's, he's got the most unconventional acrobatic style of play I've ever seen. Like, you're coming up the ice on just, you know, got a clear shot, you've made the pass, and he stacks the pads. And I'm like – what who does that <laughs> he's he's pretty much unbeatable when he gets it going <laughs> incredible <laughs> amanda before we let you go and you've done such a fantastic job with us today we can't thank you enough for joining us i'm just curious what's your favorite blind hockey memory i have one memory um it was a couple of years ago in the development division and uh, I assisted Brody McKenzie's goal. I'm not sure if it was first, but he's really excited. And mm. just the whole, the whole uh, succession of events that followed, just kind of Matt yelled something about cancer being awful and mm. people were hugging and it was just a big, I, just, I, like, I like being able to contribute to other people's big moments. Oh. Just because I know, I know how it feels to kind of, break through that that barrier scoring your first goal or what have it amanda we can't thank you enough for your time uh we hope you're staying safe you and your family and uh you know we hope we're all back on the ice sooner than later because uh, i think we're all itching to get back there i, I agree 100 percent. Uh, thanks for having me by the way it's, just, it's a great Absolutely. opportunity i love it no, you were super, and we'll definitely have to have you on again. And uh, we wish you all the best with your career in the sport. Again, we're joined by Amanda Provan from the Toronto Ice Owls blind hockey team. Amanda, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Nico. Well, it was great to hear from Amanda and her love for the sport of blind hockey. Laura, you and Amanda are also good friends off the ice. 
How does it feel to know that you have other women in the community that share your same passion for the sport? It's, it's great. Um, when I first started um, the 2014, I was the only female on my team in that tournament. There were other females, but I was the only female. Um, it's just, it's nice to know it's, you know, females and males sometimes play hockey a little bit differently. Maybe our mindsets are different. Um, but it, it's nice to have that connection. Um, and, and we also both live in Sudbury, Ontario, so Northern Ontario. So that's kind of a special bond too, I guess, just, you know, being from the same place and traveling to Toronto to play hockey like that, the love and the passion to play is the same because we travel, you know, over four hours to play one game on a Sunday, you know, morning, and then we could travel another like four hours back. So it's, it's nice to have that, that bond and um, that understanding and, that's other female in the change room to kind of talk with and bond with before the game and after the game. No, I'm curious. What do you think are the next steps to getting more women and girls into the sport of blind hockey? And what does Canadian blind hockey need to do to get there? I think number one is just promotion and just making people understand a, that females can play hockey and that just because we're female, doesn't mean we can't I think it's like number one and then secondly that just give making sure that they're aware that they have a safe place that it doesn't have to be co-ed if they don't want to that we're we're making the steps forward to try to create a safe comfortable place for them to develop those skills and learn those skills um, so I, I would say probably promotion is the big one and then just being open arms so when someone a female does come and wanting to play that we welcome them and make them feel welcome and, and don't make them feel like because they're female, they, they're not as important or they can't play. I think we just need to be welcoming and, and promote it. And, um, you know, it's, it's a struggle in, in female hockey generally. So I think it's just something that we as a society have to kind of work on is just promoting it and celebrating it too. So, so celebrating any of our successes as female players. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here, Laura, because I know that you and Amanda are teammates with the Ice Owls, but not only have you played with each other, you've actually competed against each other as well. So what makes Amanda a great teammate and what makes her so tough to play against? I think it's actually funny because I think we've actually played against each other more than we've actually been on the same team. Um, even with the Ice Owls, it seems like we tend to play against each other more than we actually play with each other. Um, but like to, as a teammate, she's just very passionate. She just, she wants to do well. She wants her team to do well. Um, you know, she, she's going to give it her all every time she steps on the ice. She's not going to, you know, even if she's tired, not feeling the best, she's going to push through it. She's not going to say, Oh, I don't feel good. There's, you know, four other people on, on the ice right now. Like she's, she's going to give it her all every shift. And I think that's really important for a teammate and, and, you know, a line mate. Uh, that's really, really important. Um, as an opponent, she's tough. She, she's got some speed. She, you know, she's, she's tough. She, it's hard to stop her sometimes. So, I mean, it's, it's tough. So it's just trying to read her, I guess, as an opponent and, uh, kind of figure out her, where she's going to go and what she, where she's going to shoot. But, uh, yeah, she's got some speed there. So, <laughs> Uh, well, we certainly appreciate your analysis and honest answer there with your teammate. And, of course, we appreciate Amanda joining us. But, folks, stay tuned because up next, it's one of my favorite segments of the show. We're heading out west to Vancouver for our player profile up next. Now it's time for one of my favorite segments of the show, the Canadian Blind Hockey Podcast Player Profile. During this Player Profile segment, we'll be sharing your blind hockey testimonials. Each week, we'll feature a different player from the community. And this episode's Player Profile features Danielle Main from the Vancouver Eclipse Blind Hockey Team. The slogan said... Blind hockey is for everyone. I mulled that over while considering various sports that had been suggested to me. Blind hockey? Not in a million years had I ever thought about playing ice hockey. 
but I've also never been one to turn up my nose at new things. So I said yes, sign me up for the Vancouver Eclipse Blind Hockey Team. I hadn't been on ice skates since I was 8 years old, back when I had significantly greater amount of vision. Yet here I was, trying to navigate, putting on hockey gear and playing for the first time in my life. All I could think about was, why am I doing this? It took me only four weeks of showing up, adopting the self-proclaimed human pylon title with a grin on my face, and the acceptance of invitations to go to lunch with the team to start getting it. Blind hockey is not about how well you play. It's about the fact that you can play. Blind hockey epitomizes the meaning of inclusiveness in sport. I won't lie, trying to learn how to skate as an adult isn't easy. You feel like a baby deer trying to walk for the first time. The learning is long and slow, but for me every moment of it was worth it. Never had I ever felt so accepted into a community of people before, after spending my whole life trying to blend in and avoid any conversation about my visual impairment, I had found my tribe. I have been finishing my education as a registered massage therapist over the last year and a half, and playing blind hockey has become an invaluable outlet that has kept me sane during this time. Blind hockey has given me the opportunity to be social, to travel, to meet amazing people, and to push myself past challenges that made me feel out of my element. Blind hockey has taught me what inclusiveness really is, and as I can attest, blind hockey is truly for everyone. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. We need your help. We are still looking for a name for this podcast. As we mentioned back in episode one, today is the last day to send Canadian Blind Hockey your suggestions because we will be selecting the best four names and creating a poll across our social media platforms on Twitter and Facebook. And the name with the most votes will be our new podcast name. Not only that, the winner will receive a special prize. Thanks to Boomer Hockey, the contest winner will receive a set of customized blind hockey targets with the Canadian Blind Hockey logo on them to help train your accuracy at home. Thanks to Boomer Hockey for hooking us up with this prize and be sure to visit boomerhockey.ca to get your own set of targets. Laura, what do you think about this? Is this exciting or what? Oh, so exciting. I would love a pair of those targets. The fact that they make a noise when you hit them, you actually know as a blind hockey player that you hit them. Um, Because that's always a thing where if I would do it, I would need somebody there to let me know. So the fact that I could practice it on my own time would be so great. Such a great prize. So awesome. And I got to think, being able to cast the vote on Twitter and Facebook is great for, for our community as well. Oh yes. Very accessible. I think that will make it, you know, that much, it's that much easier for sure. Absolutely. Well, again, get your name suggestions in ASAP, because as we mentioned, the contest closes today at midnight. So send your suggestions to info at blindicehockey.com. All right, coming up next, we're heading out to Calgary to catch up with Megan Mahon. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. I'm now very pleased to be joined by Megan Mahon from the Calgary Seeing Ice Dogs. Megan, thank you for joining us here. Thanks for having me, Nico. I'm excited. Absolutely. And we're excited to have you on the show because I don't know how many viewers know about your athletic career, but you're actually a Paralympian. You represented Team Canada in goalball at the 2016 Paralympic Games in Rio de Janeiro. 
So I'm curious, as an elite level athlete, what are your thoughts on Canadian blind hockey starting a women's specific blind hockey program? I think it is amazing. Um, there's been a lot of, you know, women in sport movements going on recently and the importance of having just designated um, women's sports kind of teams or programs or organizations and for Canadian blind hockey to be taking that step forward. I think it's just going to develop those you know, young kids that we see coming out. And I remember when I started playing blind hockey and you jumped in with the men or you didn't jump in at all. So um, having this opportunity now for women of all ages, this may bring out you know, women in their 40s who were just not comfortable playing with the men. So I'm really excited for it. Oh, that's, a, that's a really great point. Um, what do you foresee as the future of the program? Um, I definitely, you know, out here in um, Calgary, I'm fortunate to have a team that I get to play with and uh, have younger um, women, specifically Cassandra, who was um, yeah. previously on here with you, um, working together and just seeing her develop and seeing not only her skill, but her confidence. And I think that that is the biggest thing that I see for the program is developing confidence, developing those skills, and then showing it off to the rest of the world that not only the boys in Canada can play hockey, but your women can also hold it with the best of them. You know, I'm glad you mentioned your relationship with Cassandra. We'll touch on that in a little bit. But um, just because you've been to the highest level, the Paralympic Games, what would it mean to you to see blind hockey included in the Paralympics one day? It would be amazing. I know that it's, uh, it's definitely a goal, and it's definitely a goal that can be achieved. Um, I, there's no one that I wouldn't want to experience what I experienced attending my first Paralympic Games and working four years between um, Rio and Tokyo, which is now five years. So um, just that work and that satisfaction that you get from, you know, it's, it's not just attending the games. It's a process in qualifying and building with your team and working on yourself in order to be the best athlete you can. So having that opportunity for other Canadians in our nation's sport is going to be amazing. You know, your national goalball teammate, Amy Burke, has a son, Lucas, who is also partially sighted, and he actually participates in the Canadian Blind Hockey Ottawa 67's Children and Youth Blind Hockey Program. What does it mean to you to see that blind hockey is becoming a legitimate para-sport and an opportunity for the next generation of kids who are blind or partially sighted. I absolutely love it. Um, I was fortunate enough to be in Ottawa over the winter um, to do some training and I had stayed with Amy and Lucas and the excitement. I was there for you know a day that he had hockey and unfortunately Amy and I were not able to attend. We were at our own practice but uh, when him and Papa picked us up from practice and he was so excited to tell us that he worked on skating backwards and he was pushing with both feet and just the excitement that he was able to give kind of made me remember why I fell in love with the sport. And I think having that development, there's nothing better. You know, you attended the first ever Canadian Blind Hockey Summer Development Camp in Burnaby way back in 2014. Uh, this was the first ever training camp for the para-sport of blind hockey. And it actually turned out to be a huge deal for growing the sport in Canada and then subsequently around the world. What were your memories of that camp and how did it help you develop as a blind hockey player? I think... You know, my first memory was um, just going, going from Northern Ontario on my own. Um, I was 18 at the time and, you know, asked, do I really need parent supervision? <laughs> so I uh, went out there and just the experience, meeting the other players, meeting their families. Um, it's the relationships that were formed. I look at 
you know, someone like Alec Angus, who now is a very predominant player on the national team and just seeing where we all started um, and then, you know, seeing some other paths. I'm still connected with David Johnson, who, mm -hmm. you know, he was also at the camp and at the Parapan American Games in Lima, Peru, we passed each other, double took, and, you know, he's now running track. I was there for goalball, and those relationships were probably the first memories and the ones that I will carry. Oh, that's very cool. Uh, and I mean, speaking of those relationships and memories, you touched on it a little bit earlier in our conversation, but uh, I think you're in this incredible position where you've got an opportunity to be a role model for that next generation of young female blind hockey players, including Cassandra Ruddle, who you mentioned. Now, I was hoping you could touch a little bit more on the relationship that you have with Cassandra and maybe what it means to you that you're a role model to that next generation. The relationship Cassandra and I have is really cool. Um, I see the Ruddle family more than they probably want to see me um, with my work at CNIB as well as hockey. I probably see Cassandra five to eight times a month. <laughs> um, and, you know, when they're able to get out on Sunday nights for hockey and play. Um, for some reason, the girls make it out of the dressing room way before the boys. Um, so her and I are on the ice out there and we start with just doing some drills and they're just some fun drills that, you know, she absolutely loves doing. I love doing them. Um, working with her and being able to kind of bring up that next generation of women in sport is something that is extremely special to me. Um, I think that you know, growing up, always being involved in sport, but then pairing women in sport with parasport. And that's something that I hold really true to myself um, and the importance of, you know, sport is for everyone, whether it's lawn bowling to hockey to swimming, whatever it is, it is for everyone and the relationship that I have with Cassandra, I hope will only continue to grow and we'll be able to uh, play together in, you know, a all female program. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, obviously I started Parasport TV and the hashtag I love to use is sports are for everyone. And, you know, I, I truly um, agree and embrace what, you know, that sentiment is because, Regardless of, you know, what your day-to-day -day life or your situation is, it's an opportunity, you know, to be out there and level the playing field and just enjoy the, you know, athletic pursuit of the game. So I couldn't agree more there. Um, you know, you've had an incredible athletic career and you've had the opportunity to do something that I think many Canadian kids dream of doing, but very few actually have the opportunity to do. And that's representing our nation on the international level, uh, again, at the Paralympics. I was wondering if you might be able to show us, share a bit of a Paralympic story or memory with us. Um, there's so many to choose from. <laughs> I think my um, biggest one that sticks with me was even prior to the games. And it was when um, head coach Trent Fairbrother gave me a call. I was not expecting it. We were in May of 2016. The games began in August. Wasn't expecting it, was fully ready to just support my team that was going out there. Um, and he called me and asked if I could fit Rio into my schedule. So of course, without hesitation, I 100% jumped into that. Um, but at the games, my, the moment that vividly still plays in my head is those opening ceremonies. And, you know, behind the scenes, it's a lot of hurry up and wait and anticipation and all of my teammates had previously attended a Paralympic. So I was the only one going in having no idea what to expect. Um, and then walking into that stadium with the rest of Team Canada, not only my goalball team, but us as a sport nation representing our country, 
walking in and having an entire stadium lights everyone you know lights cheering it was just surreal um i still look back on photos because there's bits and pieces that i was just so excited that i don't remember sure but that's outside of that and then the games themselves um again i went to rio really just expecting to be a sponge mm. and was thrown in and given my shot and you know it it was amazing i learned more than i ever could want to learn in a three week period but uh, just going in and having the support of my team and them telling me that you know you can do this you've been working hard to do this is the things that will stick with me very cool now i've also heard that the athletes villages can be pretty interesting <laughs> places <laughs> i don't know if there's any stories or things you can share with us but uh was it was it a good time down there in the athletes village <laughs> the athletes village is amazing um you meet so many different people you know we mm. canada goes in we kind of take over our building um we are a large delegation and we come in usually the main floor of a building we have that entire space we have our doctors we have our tech teams we have everything we could possibly need um but I think some of the coolest village moments are the pin game. So <laughs> the pin game, um, each delegation, you go in with pins from your delegation. Mm -hmm. And you come out just trying to get as many different ones as you possibly can. So those, you know, pin games happen at Paralympics, Parapan American Games. Um, and just, it turns into a little competition inside your team as well as to who can get what pins and you start to kind of have to try to steal pins from your teammates to be able to <laughs> trade when you lose your own country's to your own country's pins you start okay which ones don't i want you know which ones do i want more than others so that's a really cool part of the village that just gets everybody kind of mingling and getting to know each other and you're there for i mean we were in rio for two and a half weeks i believe and it, you just have to make it your home. Very cool. And that's, that's some neat insight. I'd never heard about the pin game, so that's really cool. Uh, you know, Megan, I think it's pretty safe to say that the end game for people within the blind hockey community and for blind hockey as a sport is to be included in the Paralympics. Personally, do you think that blind hockey will be included in a future Paralympic Games? I 100% see it. Um, the Paralympics and Olympics grow each quadrennial. It, you know, we look now and what was added to the 2020 games of surfing and rock climbing. Um, there's no reason why blind hockey cannot be added to a winter Paralympic games. I think definitely well on the way um, with, you know, just creating a community all across the world. Not only having Canadian blind hockey and U.S. blind hockey, but now we're dipping into Europe, and we know that once we dip into Europe, it just grows from there. It's a huge growth over there, and once one country starts, they all want to get on board, so I definitely see it as a possibility. Well, Megan, we can't thank you enough for taking time to join us here today. You've been absolutely fantastic, and we really appreciate all your insight and sharing all your stories and memories. Before we let you go, is there anything you want to ask me or anything you want to say to all your friends and teammates around the blind hockey community? Um, I think I would just want to say that, you know, on those rough days where the skills just aren't going right, or you really don't want to put those skates on and hit the ice, those are the days that you're going to learn the most. And those are the days that you will carry forward. You know, everyone loves scoring that game winning goal. But when you perfect your backwards crossovers, it's just as good. So just keep working, move forward. And it's an entire community. So you're not doing it alone. Well, Megan, thank you so much for your time. Once again, this has been Megan Mahan, a member of the Canadian National Women's Goalball Team and a member of the Calgary Seeing Ice Dogs.
Hey everybody, I am now super excited to be joined by the captain of the Nova Scotia Sea Kings, Mary Ellen McKechn. Mary Ellen, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we've got a special surprise for you. I don't know if you know this or not. This episode is going to be airing on your birthday, June 12th. So on behalf of the entire blind hockey community, we want to wish you a very happy birthday. Thank you so much. Of course. Mary Ellen, how old are you and how long have you been playing blind hockey? Um, well, I'm 10 years old and I'm turning 11 on Friday. And I've been playing blind hockey since as long as I can remember. That's amazing. Um, I got to ask, do you have any special plans for your birthday? Um, no, me and my cousin, we have a birthday in the same month, so we both got paddle boards, and so that was basically just it, what we did. Oh, that's super exciting. Good stuff. Um, now, I understand you come from a very special but small community called Mabu in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, here in Canada. And I understand that in your community, you guys have a slightly different version of Happy Birthday involving the shoe. Uh, I was wondering if you might be able to sing that for us. Oh, it's Happy Birthday to you. You live in Mavu. You shop at the Fresh Mart and you eat at the shoe. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Well, I got to know, what's your favorite type of birthday cake? Well, I like pretty much every flavor of birthday cake as long as it's from the fresh marks well again mary ellen happy birthday and again we want to thank you so much for joining us here today now i'm very curious because you were named the captain of the nova scotia sea kings blind hockey team and as you mentioned you're just about to turn 11 years old so i gotta think that that's a pretty special and huge honor for you I was wondering, what do you love most about blind hockey? And what was it like being named captain? Well, what I love most about blind hockey is everyone can be their self and you're not like always working hard to just keep up with everything and always trying to see the puck. It's like very easy and it's just really fun. Mm -hmm. And what I felt like when I found out I was going to be captain was I was really excited and I was just like super like I was like scared I was like oh my god why did they pick me and so that, it was just really good that's pretty cool I got to imagine that was a very special moment especially because blind hockey runs in your family and your brother Alec Angus or as his teammates and friends like to call him AMAC He's part of that team, and he's part of the Canadian national blind team. So what was that like for you within your own home to say that, yeah, you might be my older brother, but I'm the team captain? Well, it was – I had huge bragging rights. Oh, for sure. No question about it. Now, I'm curious because you've been there – alongside your brother the whole time, his whole journey. And, you know, from all those triad sessions to now when he plays for the national team, all those experiences for you as a fan watching your brother, what was that like? It was really fun because I just remember, like, when I was little and I watched his first game, I just, like, remember thinking, oh, that's definitely what I want to do. Like, I want to be super famous for it. I want to do everything with it. I'm like, yeah. And Mary Ellen, you just told us about how you grew up introduced to the sport by watching your brother, AMAC, play. And then you ended up watching so much that you wanted to get involved. So can you tell us a little bit about what made you want to get on the ice and the first couple times you actually tried playing blind hockey? Well, the first time that I really wanted to get on the ice, it was like a, my brother went on for the first time, and I was like, oh, that looks like a lot of fun. 
And so then he went on a couple more times, and then I was just like, you know what, you're having all the fun. I need to have some fun too. So then it just started to happen from there. Oh, that's pretty incredible. And, you know, I don't know if you know this, but you're going to have a chance potentially to achieve those dreams because Mary Ellen, Canadian Blind Hockey is starting a women's program so that all girls and all women who are blind or partially sighted all across Canada have a pathway to play blind hockey at whatever level they want, including, as you just said, at a national team level. So what do you think about that? I mean, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's going to be, like, awesome. I'm going to work my hardest when, as soon as it happens because I really want to, like, just be as good as I can. Now, because you and your brother, Amac, both are superstar blind hockey players, we're going to do a little rapid fire, you and me, okay? It's kind of like I'm going to ask you questions, and it's going to be about you or your brother, maybe who's the better player or stuff like that, and you just don't overthink it. Just shout out whatever comes to mind, okay? Yeah. Okay, so my first question for you, who is better on a breakaway, Mary Ellen or Alec Angus? Oh, definitely me. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Um, who is the better stick handler, you or your brother? Probably my brother. Mm, okay. All right. That's something we can practice. Who's got the better backhand shot, Mary Ellen or Alex Angus? Me, probably. I like it. Because when I was little, mm -hmm. I, like, I, did, I had my brother's old stick but he uses the other hand, and so I would always have to play with the other hand, so yeah. That's so funny. When I was little, I used to go to a friend's house, and he had he was a left-handed shot. I was right-handed, so I know exactly what you mean. You get really good at your backhand when you're forced to use the wrong hand stick. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Okay, now I've got a tricky question. If an emergency situation happened and there was no one else to play goalie, who would be more likely to play goalie, you or your brother? Probably me because on our girls' hockey team in Adam, um, we didn't have a goalie at the start of the year, so we all had to take turns going in as goalie, so I feel like I would. All right, some hidden skills there. I like it. All right, last rapid-fire question for you. Who's got the stinkier skates, you or your brother? Him. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was an easy one, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Mary Ellen, that was super fun. I can't thank you enough for joining us. Um, before we say goodbye, is there any messages you want to share to your friends in the blind hockey community? Well, it's not just my birthday. It's going to be... It is Matt Morrow's blind hockey birthday, and I just want to wish him a happy birthday, too. Amazing. Happy birthday, Mary Ellen. Happy birthday, Matt. And Mary Ellen, thanks again for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Well, Laura, you've been so fantastic all show long. We can't thank you enough for pitching in with co-hosting duties today. Um, but frankly, we wouldn't be doing our jobs if I didn't ask you what your favorite top three blind hockey memories are. I can only pick three, eh? Uh, that's <laughs> tough. Um, I mean, I guess my first one would have to be 2014, my very first time playing at the National uh, Canadian National Blind Hockey Tournament. Um, I had, like I had mentioned before, 2013, I had gone down and saw it, but I didn't get a chance to play. 2014, I did. Um, that was the first time I ever played blind hockey. It's the first time I played with um, the bigger puck, smaller nets. Um, and playing with people who also couldn't see that, you know, I always relied on my teammates who could see the puck and knew where it was. So that was nerve wracking. And I had to actually stopped playing hockey for a few years um, because of my vision deteriorating and not being able to play hockey. So 
I was rusty and I was going into playing blind hockey with a whole bunch of guys who have been playing on a regular basis that still played side out hockey. And uh, as a female going in, that can be intimidating whether you're still playing hockey or not. And then being a little rusty was uh, a little nerve wracking and not knowing anyone. I had, you know, I met Mark and uh, Matt the year before, but it was just a brief like introduction. So I didn't really know anyone. So that was really nerve wracking and um, kind of overwhelming. But my team, Paul uh, was my coach that year, and my team were so welcoming. Um, it, it didn't instantly, it changed my view on it, and it made that year the, probably the best year playing hockey. Everyone was very opening, open and welcoming. Um, they always made sure I was in the room for the pregame um, talk. Uh, they always would get mad at Paul if he started to do the talk and they didn't realize I was already in the room and they would yell at him to stop to make sure I was there, um, even though I already was. Um, so no, that was great. That was just a very, for the first time playing blind hockey, I couldn't have asked for a better experience um, whatsoever. The second one I would have to say, 2016 for the US Disabled uh, Hockey Festival, we went to Detroit. Um, at that point, I knew some people, still not a lot, because I only had played at the national tournaments. Um, but it was great, because I got to, do, meet a lot of the the ice owls that I now play with and that I now call friends. Um, so it was on on that terms really great. And um, my last game of that series was one of the best games I had probably played since I started playing blind hockey. And I normally play forward. That game I played defense um, and I made some really good smart moves. I actually stepped up and took the puck away from Mark who was trying to come in and everyone just kind of like dropped the draw like they weren't expecting that and I don't know if it's because I was new never they never saw me play defense if I was a female I don't really don't know but it was kind of like people were like whoa like you just stepped up not many people will just step up um and so just kind of it kind of clicked that people realized like okay it's so like she, she knows the game she can play she can keep up with the boys kind of thing so that was that was kind of cool too um and then I guess my third one would be well kind of three and four gets combined is joining the ice owls and playing with them on a more regular basis and having that like actual team um, because I had been playing just as an individual player at the, the tournament. So it was nice to be part of an actual team. Um, and there was one game just, I think maybe two years ago, I'm not sure if that's exactly right. Uh, I was playing and I was on the same line as Emily. And I think that even beats the Detroit game, my best game I played playing blind hockey Emily and I just clicked, and I think it's because we both grew up playing side at hockey, women's hockey. Um, you know, if I was younger and I grew up playing at the same age as Emily, I think we would have been playing against each other because of where she lived and where I played. Um, and so the way that our coaches would have taught us and the way we just, we knew kind of how each other played, we really clicked. And um, we both played really good games and had some few points on the scoreboard that game. So it was just nice to kind of connect with another female player and it was nice to kind of get that feeling back of like how I used to play because I've been a little rusty so it was just it was nice to get that feeling back and it was nice to play again like side by side with another female player. Oh, those are very special memories for sure and we appreciate you sharing those with us Laura. Well folks stay tuned because up next we're going to be catching up with Canadian Blind Hockey Executive Director Matt Morrow. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. I'm now very excited to be joined by Canadian Blind Hockey Executive Director, Matt Morrow. Today's episode was all about the new Canadian Women's Blind Hockey Program. Matt, can you tell us a little bit more about the program, how it came to be and what the goals of the program are? Absolutely, thanks for having me, Nico. So the Canadian Women's Program had really come out of the idea that you know, the vision for Canadian blind hockey has always been to be world leaders in blind hockey. And when you look at trends uh, growing elsewhere, obviously over the last year, there, there's been major media coverage and, and the potential for growth in the women's side of the game just in general. Uh, one of the things that we've seen is a group that we've partnered with a, a little bit uh, to run an event in, in Leduc uh, was the Canadian National Women's Sled Program. And so, you know, 
following from their example, they, they felt that even though sled hockey was technically co-ed, they felt that they needed a program dedicated to the women's development side of the game. And, and we thought, you know, that's, that's a great um, lead for us to follow. We should absolutely be putting together a stream of programming that focuses on providing opportunities uh, to women and girls to play blind hockey. What do you hope uh, the future of Canadian women's blind hockey is? So I've had the opportunity to uh, coach at the development camp for every year since its uh, inception in 2014. And each year it seems that we have more and more uh, female players. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to, to talk with them on and off the ice. And, and we really want to know what they'd like out of their program. And I know in the same way that uh, in general, you know, you have people that are interested in, in different parts of the game. That's one of the beautiful things about hockey. It truly is sport for life, right? You've got... You've got players that want to learn to train and, and take it as far as they possibly can. You've got other players that uh, they're, they're more just out there for recreation and, and fun. Um, and you've got players that are, you know, high performance that want to compete against the best on the best. So what we'd like to see for the women's side of the game is really that we continue to offer all those different levels of long-term athlete development programming. Uh, and eventually we can recruit enough women into blind hockey that they can have their own uh, women's national blind hockey team. No, that's an interesting point. I think back on some of the interviews we had in this episode and <clears throat> one that really sticks out to me, the when we chatted with Mary Ellen McKechn and she just had this huge smile on her face, this genuine excitement about the possibility of one day wearing a Canadian jersey representing her country as part of the Canadian women's national blind hockey team. You know, I think the women in our program uh, very much want to see their program included in the Paralympics. And I got to think that you um, echo that sentiment. Oh, absolutely, Nico. I mean, we've, we've been very forthcoming that our mission is to allow any Canadian who is blind or partially sighted the opportunity to participate in hockey, period. So um, if we need to create new streams of programming to allow that to happen, that's what we're all about. And one of the biggest successes we've had over the last couple of years is when we started our youth programs. You know, previously we had just, we had held try it sessions for youth and we ran tournaments for adults. But there was this huge gap in long-term athlete development where really there was there was no avenue for, for the kids uh, to compete. And so when we started that GTA children and youth program in 2018, and then subsequently added the children and youth division to our national tournament, I mean, right there, we saw a significant growth in our community. And I think these youth programs, you know, with participants like Mary Ellen, that's, that's really the future of blind hockey. Um, you know, at the adult level, approximately 10 to 15% of our participants are female. But in our youth programs, that number is closer to 40%. So there is a lot of interest in the future of women's blind hockey. And I would like to see the opportunity uh, for the women to compete. I know some women, you know, really like competing in the co-ed. And other players have expressed to me that, you know, their dream would be to get out there and play in the first ever game with women-only blind hockey players. And I think realistically, with the grant that we got from the Daryl K. Seaman Canadian Blind Hockey Fund, or Canadian Hockey Fund, rather, uh, funding blind hockey programs since 2014, um, we may have the opportunity to help achieve that dream sooner than later. Once it's safe and responsible for us to get back out on the ice and we can host that first women's camp, I think there's a, there's a chance that history can be made. and We can have, you know, the first time where all 12 athletes on the ice playing in a game uh, are all women's blind hockey players. Oh, that's certainly very exciting. And uh, we all look forward to the development of that program. And like you said, when it's safe and responsible to get things in action on that side. Um, but, you know, we are in this um, uncertain time and unprecedented time right now with COVID-19. So I have to ask, Matt, because, um, you know, this virus has created all sorts of challenges to organizations in all sorts of industries worldwide and it's specifically causing a lot of chaos uh, within the global sports landscape so I'm curious how has Canadian blind hockey 
responded to the COVID-19 imposed limitations? And what is the organization's plan going forward? Well, one of our first strategies was to hire you, Nico, try to get you more involved. I think, uh, you know, at Canadian Blind Hockey, we always talk about how what happens off the ice is equal, if not more important than what actually happens between the whistles. And our players, you know, reinforce that all the time. And I think for, for some individuals that, you know, really rely on their blind hockey uh, programming for the opportunity to go out and interact with others uh, within the community, it was a huge blow to lose the national tournament. I mean, we've been running that national tournament you know, 2011, 2012 were the precursors, but really 2013 is when we found our home in Toronto. So there are many people, myself included, yourself included, that really look forward to that weekend each and every year uh, as a highlight. And, and, you know, there's been, there's been a lot of special things that have happened over the years. So, you know, I think one of the, the great ideas that, you know, came out from brainstorming was when we decided to pivot and host an online event. And, you know, we put that together relatively last minute, yourself, myself, uh, and program manager, Luca Demonis. Uh, but it was really neat to see how the whole community got engaged. Uh, and it really led us to realize how valuable uh, a show like this podcast would be. So uh, certainly thank you for your work on this Canadian, yet to be named Canadian Blind Hockey Podcast. Uh, it's been really neat to see such a wide array of topics and individuals. You know, I mean, we've had players from right across the country. We've had youth players. We've had national team players. We've had coaches. Uh, and just to see the passion in everybody. I mean, I think that's the one thing that unites everyone. The other thing is going to be our webinars, our new webinar series. We were pleased. It was, it was very last minute. And to anybody that missed uh, the opportunity to participate, we apologize. Uh, it was just the way that it came up. But we hosted the webinar number one last week with uh, – Toronto Maple Leafs slash Toronto Marley's Rich Clune. And uh, Clune was an incredibly inspiring guest. Uh, it was also very informative. He touched on a large array of topics from off ice conditioning, nutrition, goal setting, uh, as well as we got to know him a little bit better. And uh, you, you could really see from the feedback we received um, from everybody, just, you know, how much something like that means to people to have the opportunity to get together and, and to be part of blind hockey programming, even if, even if we can't get on the ice. So um, I'm here to announce a couple of things today. Uh, the first I'm assuming most people will have already gathered, but uh, based on following the uh, lead of hockey Canada, as well as best practices, you know, I have to announce that unfortunately we're not going to be able to host the summer camp uh, in July in person, the way that we had planned on. Hockey Canada's announced all their camps are canceled through uh, September 1st. And so that's the timeline we're going to follow as well. Um, so over the course of the summer, we're going to try to bring you some new content each week, though. We're, we're focused on bringing this podcast every second week and looking at some webinars uh, every second week when the podcast doesn't air. So at least each and every week, we should have the opportunity to, to get some new blind hockey content together. Uh, we're also going to be focusing on making sure that it's uh, training content. We want you and, and the feedback from our players is that they want the opportunity to develop into even better athletes during this time. So, you know, one of the things Rich um, Clune stressed was, you know, never skip leg day. And I think that's, uh, you know, as hockey players, you know, it should be obvious, but maybe sometimes it's not. So, you know, and at home, if you can't have access to, uh, gym equipment, there's nothing wrong with training leg day with just body weight, right? There's so much you can do. So we're going to continue to create and provide more resources and tools. And we also want feedback from the community. We want to know what would be beneficial to you. Uh, we, we've obviously got some ideas. Again, we're trying to follow best practices in other organizations such as Hockey Canada. But uh, if there's things that you think would be beneficial to you as a blind hockey player, um, that's something we want to hear. And then lastly, we're going to be delving into blind ball hockey a little bit. We've, we've successfully piloted some blind ball hockey programs uh, over the years. We haven't used it a ton because of how much our focus has been on, on ice. But we do think that there's some potential for certainly training at home. Uh, and then the government's been pretty clear across the board that outdoor programs are going to resume before indoor programs. So there's no reason that... Uh, 
that some of the teams, the, the 13 programs that exist across Canada can't uh, get together this summer or fall once it's safe and responsible and uh, enjoy some blind ball hockey. Oh, that's very exciting stuff. Um, Matt, if folks want to get in touch with you, maybe learn a bit more about the program, stuff that's, you know, in the works, how can they get in touch with you? I mean, I think the first thing for anybody, in case they haven't seen it, uh, about a year ago, we launched our new CanadianBlindHockey.com website. So it's a pretty comprehensive resource that uh, outlines all the Canadian blind hockey programs. Uh, in the blog section is where we'll have updates on uh, newer programs, upcoming things. If you are a Canadian blind hockey player in that you belong to one of the 13 programs across the country, uh, definitely check your email. Email is our preferred method of contacting you about these webinars. The webinars are open only to those in the blind hockey community. So these are exclusive training webinars for Canadian blind hockey, uh, the next of which will be next week. So um, that's something to definitely keep, uh, keep a lookout for in your email. Uh, and then, of course, always you can email me at mattmorrow at blindicehockey.com. Matt, we can't thank you enough for your time. Before we let you go, is there anything you want to say in closing to the community? Just a huge thank you to the community. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of disappointment when we had to cancel nationals. And I, and I think everybody realizes how serious this, this disruption has been for, for all sports organizations. But we thank you for being patient. Uh, we thank you for supporting our online programs. It's you know, when you pivot something from a in-person on ice program to now trying to go exclusively through online and at home platforms, you never really know what the feedback's going to be like when you try something new. But, you know, these, um, these early podcasts, you know, the, the viewing party had over 200 views an episode. I think these podcasts are averaging over 300 views and growing, um, you know, on our last minute webinar training, we had over 30 participants, which was more than expected. And I think with, you know, more notice that these webinars are going to grow probably, you know, maybe approaching the hundreds. So uh, not only a thank you to the community, but of course, our sponsors and partners who make it possible. Um, Canadian Blind Hockey has grown so much over the last two years in particular. I've worked with Canadian Blind Hockey since, um, well, since its inception, really, and I've been full time since 2012. And we experienced steady growth for a long time, but nothing like the last two years. So for our presenting partner, AMI, uh, our national program partner, CMIB Foundation, the Daniel Family Foundation, uh, Electra Health, Mannion, uh, those are our national partners that, that have really made this possible. And, and to so many of you that are watching that are donors, we run our crowdfunding campaigns, whether it's to support the national team or it's to support just our programming in general. Um, you know, the donors out there right across the country, uh, your contributions make a huge difference. Uh, and of course, our regional partners. I mean, we've got a great partnership, as you've mentioned, with the uh, OSEG Foundation for the new Ottawa 67s blind hockey program. Uh, certainly CNIB Toronto uh, with, our, with our GTA youth program. Um, you know, to, to any other potential partner that I forgot, GTHL Canada, um, lots and lots of groups who help make hockey possible in Canada. So uh, on behalf of the board of directors and the entire association, absolutely thank you to everybody that contributes to making blind hockey possible in Canada. Matt, on behalf of the blind hockey community, we want to wish you a very happy birthday and uh, we want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Canadian, My pleasure, Nico. Yep. Canadian Blind Hockey Executive Director, Matt Morrow. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be back with more after this short break. Well, Laura, that about wraps up episode three of the Canadian Blind Hockey Podcast. Today's show featured a focus on the new Canadian Women's Blind Hockey Development Plan. We have so many inspiring female blind hockey players across our community, and it's time that there was a dedicated program for women's blind hockey. What did you think of this week's episode, Laura, and what are your hopes and dreams for the future of this sport? 
I think it's great. I think this episode will really help promote uh, not just blind hockey, but females playing blind hockey. I think it will help show that we can play. We're just as talented that we can, you know, we, we can play the game that we all love. And I think this will just help promote it and help encourage maybe other female hockey players who blind hockey players who haven't maybe tried blind hockey yet or were unsure um, that you can do it, that this just shows some of our stories and they, they can, they can look at it and say that, Hey, I like, look at my ability, not my disability. I can do this too. Um, so I, I think it's going to be really good for the growth of female hockey. And I really hope that um, we can grow it to the point where we have more females playing and want to play in the passion and that we can grow it to it, to a national team. Laura, you did a phenomenal job as co-host this week. I want to thank you so much for being here with us and for being such a great ambassador for blind hockey and women's blind hockey. Before we let you go, is there any final words you want to share with the community? Um, well, thanks for welcoming me with open arms back in 2014. And I just want to tell anyone that's watching this who hasn't played to come. You know, we're a community, we're a family, and um, we all support each other. We all see the ability, not the disability. We, we believe in each other. And, and uh, if you want to do it, do it. I mean, don't let other people's limitations or judgments um, stop you from doing what you want to do. You're the one that can set your limitations and you're the one that can decide whether you can do it or not. So follow what you want to do, not what others want to do and come out and have fun. Uh, before we wrap things up, is there anything you have for me? Any questions you want to ask me? Oh, that's a tough one, Nico. Um, <laughs> what would be, oh, what are your, some of your favorite play-by-play uh, -play commentator, like plays that you've, you've shown over the years? Like what are, what's one moment that sticks in your mind? Oh, I mean, that's... you've done a lot of games and a lot of, at different levels. So like what, what's the one that just, for whatever reason, sticks in your mind? You know, that's a really great question. Um, and you're right. Like I've done a lot of games over the years and at times the memories or the games themselves start to blend. You can, you start to forget which goal was scored in which game and all that just because you do so much of it. But I think the one impression and memory that will always stick with me um, was back in 2013. I would, I just graduated from college um, and I had been hired by Hockey Canada to go to Ottawa and call the double IHF Women's World Hockey Championships. And for me, that was like an unbelievable experience. I, you know, they flew me out there, put me up in this fancy posh hotel. We were calling games at the home of the Ottawa Senators. I was, you know, I'll never forget the moment where I was in an NHL press box calling a Canada USA game with 10,000 fans below me screaming their heads off cheering on our Canadian women that you know for me will always be a very special memory and uh yeah there's certainly a lot I have to look back on and, and think of but I think for me that's one that'll always stay with me I don't blame you <laughs> sounds like it would have been a good time so I don't blame you you know it was pretty cool and that's not to you know say that I don't have extremely fond memories of going down to Pittsburgh for the first international blind hockey series. And of course in Ottawa this past November and, you know, exciting for what lays ahead within our sport, because I really, you know, as, as I think back to that 2013 double IHF tournament, it excites me to think of what's ahead for our Paris sport, because I truly believe, and I think so many of us do, it's just a matter of time before we're hosting our own world championships and we're in the Paralympics. And, and that gives me goosebumps for sure. Me as well. Well, Laura, thank you again. You were absolutely phenomenal. This has been episode three of the Canadian Blind Hockey Podcast with a focus on women's blind hockey. A big thank you to Amanda, Megan, Danielle, Mary Ellen, and of course my co-host Laura Mark for their contributions to this week's episode. Thank you for tuning in. And remember, next episode drops on Friday, June 26th. Stay safe, everyone. We'll see you next time. Canadian Blind Hockey programs are supported by... 
AMI. NIB Foundation, Daniel Family Foundation, Electra Health, 